So hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us at this first Edinburgh branch online event. Um, we're really pleased to have you along. Um, today's talk will be by Professor Joe Goldblatt on the future of the Edinburgh Festival. Um, this event is being recorded and um, we can't see you, but um, obviously, hopefully <laughs> you can see us. Um, it will be recorded though, so if you have to run off um, for any reason, it will be made available um, from tomorrow for you to catch up on. Um, if you have any questions, uh, that is best put in the Q&A box so that we can find it. Um, on the bottom panel, you'll see the Q&A and the chat functions. So you can also chat amongst yourselves. There's some chat already popping off down there. Very exciting. Um, and that's good to chat with your fellow participants. But uh, if you have a question for Joe, then if you pop it in Q&A and I will read it when we get to the Q&A section. Um, so I'll hand over now to John um, from the Edinburgh branch to introduce Joe. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome from me to, to, to everyone for our very first Saltar Society Edinburgh branch event online. Laura Scott and I are very grateful indeed to Heather, to Katrina and to Sarah at HQ for setting this up for us and we're thrilled by the turnout from near and far. Joe, it seems, is the name of the month. For Burns Night, we recalled John Anderson, my Joe, and it's lockdown again, so we have Joe Wicks back on our screens. The world has witnessed the inauguration of Joe Biden as 46th US president, and that country has given us today's speaker, Joe Goldblatt, who began a remarkable career by being a mime artist long before Zoom introduced us to worrying about whether we were still muted. From performer to producer to professor, Joe's trajectory has taken him from Texas across the States and then to Scotland, bringing us his skills leading the new profession of events management at a time when there has never been more need for it. A year ago, when many of us were worried about the impact of over-tourism, remember that, on Edinburgh's open spaces, Joe was suggesting that our festivals needed to expand into virtual space. And now, following the dramatic turn of events that no one even then could have fully foretold, it seems the pandemic has decreed that virtual may be the only way for them to go. Ladies and gentlemen, over please to Emeritus Professor Joe Goldblatt. Thank you very much, John, and good afternoon, everyone. You know, John Yellowlees is a very clever convener of our branch. He contacted me several weeks ago and he said, after the uh, nomination and the potential election of Joe Biden, I know you believe in the concept of free speech. And I said, absolutely. He said, then would you give a free speech for me on the 26th of January in Edinburgh using Zoom? Oh, indeed, he's clever. And here I am. Today, I've chosen as my topic, what is the future of the Edinburgh festivals? It's a question. I will not be giving you many answers today, but rather I hope I stimulate some questions from you to add to the questions I'm going to pose today. I want to thank, begin by thanking John Yellowlees, Heather Palmer of the Saltire Society, the Edinburgh Festival City Organization, which is the umbrella group of all of our city's festivals, the City of Edinburgh Council, my PhD students, former students, Dr. Kwan Win Lin, Dr. Patrick Stein, and others that have contributed to today's talk. So we know there are knowns and unknowns. And back during the George W. Bush administration in the United States, US Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was famous for making this statement when he was asked about Iraq's ability to have weapons of mass destruction, he said, Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because we, uh, as we know, they are known, uh, knowns. They are things that we know. We also know there are known unknowns. And that is to say that we know there are some things that we absolutely do not know. And so, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country, my home country, the United States, and other free countries such as Scotland and the United Kingdom, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult ones. So today we're going to explore together the unknown 
unknowns. My agenda is very simple. I plan to take a few minutes and look back at the history of the Edinburgh festivals and then examine the pre-COVID period, COVID-19 period, the present COVID-19 period, the post-COVID-19 period, and offer you three scenarios that might be put into question for our discussion. And finally, I'll make some closing comments and welcome your questions and hopefully provide a few answers for you. So what do festivals actually mean? Well, we have to turn to Scotland for the answer because Victor Turner, a renowned anthropologist who worked with the Ndemi people in Africa, discovered that in every human society, we celebrate our joys, our sorrows, and our triumphs. Victor Turner, a native of Glasgow, his mother was actually the founder of the first National Theatre of Scotland. I defined in my first textbook, which this year celebrates its 30th anniversary, that an event is a unique moment in time celebrated with ceremony and ritual to achieve outcomes. And then, the term kaleidoscope was actually developed here in Scotland in the 19th century by David Brewster, the scientist uh, who created uh, lenses for cameras. And he said that kaleidoscopes create a multi-sensory experience as do our festivals. So there's three folk from Scotland or living in Scotland who've contributed to this definition. Now in Edinburgh, as you know, we have dozens of festivals, not just 12 or 10 or 13, but almost anything and everything can adopt and does adopt and use the festival name. But I think the first thing we have to do is define what actually is an event. The Latin word for event is a venere. A means out, venere means come. So literally an event is an outcome. This is the Usher Hall when the festival, the Edinburgh International Festival celebrated its 70th anniversary. And they brought the audience outside out with the hall for a Sonne Lumine sound and light show following the opening concert. It reminded me of my first festival experience when we moved to Scotland 15 years ago. I simply could not pass a box office without buying a ticket. The first night I went to the Whirling Dervishes of Turkey at the Festival Theater. The next night I went to the Playhouse to see the Bathsheba Dance uh, Company. The next night I went back to the Festival Theater to see the Marinsky Opera. And none of the tickets cost more than 25 or 30 pounds, but I saw three world-renowned international groups three nights in a row, something you couldn't do in any other city in the world. When my wife got her credit card statement, she said, Joe, I see you going to the box office almost every day and sometimes twice a day. I think you've got a problem. I think you're obsessed with buying tickets. And I said, well, what do you recommend? She said, I think you need therapy. Therapy, I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, talk to somebody about this because if not, we're going to go into administration. And I said, Nancy, I'm already in therapy. It's actually group therapy. She said, really, what's the group called? I said, the group, Nancy, is called the audience. So today's talk will not have the cold scalpel of science as I practiced for many years as a researcher in the classroom. Rather, you're going to hear from someone who is obsessed, passionately in love with our Edinburgh festivals and wants to see them grow from strength to strength. The uniqueness of our Edinburgh festivals is largely due to this kaleidoscopic approach first discovered by David Brewster. Because during the summer, uh, during August, we have, and we're the only city in the world that has this, eight festivals that actually overlap very closely, carefully uh, together. And this creates a blend of different markets, different cultures, et cetera, that creates the, the culture, if you will, for the world's greatest festival city by having so many festivals occurring simultaneously. Well, how did this all come to be? Well, upon the National Archives building in Washington, DC are the words 
the past is prologue. And therefore it's helpful to look at the rear view mirror and rediscover the roots of our great festivals. This plaque is at the dress circle in the Usher Hall. It was erected in 2017 at the day of the closing concert for the Edinburgh International Festival. It actually was funded and placed by the Jewish community of Edinburgh because this was the year that not only did Edinburgh's festivals turn 70, but the Jewish community turned 200. And the founders of the Edinburgh International Festival were two Jewish refugees of Nazi Germany. So Rudolf Bing, the great famous opera director of Glyndebourne, and later the director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City, and the great conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic, Bruno Walter. And as some of you who study the festivals may know, that Bruno, that Rudolf Bing telephoned or sent a cable to Bruno Walter and said, I know that the Nazis separated you from your orchestra during the war, and now that the war is over, would you like to reunite with your orchestra? And before Bruno Walter could say yes, he used the John Yellowlees approach and he said, would you do it please on this date in Edinburgh on the stage of the Usher Hall? Because he knew that if Bruno Walter would reunite with the Vienna Philharmonic, it would create an enormous buzz and excitement throughout the world. And people would come from all over to see the great conductor reunited with the orchestra that he loved. And so Rudolf Bing, Bruno Walter, John Falconer, the Lord Provost of Edinburgh at the time, Henry Wood and others created that first year, 1947, a platform for the flowering of the human spirit. And the Lord Provost encouraged every citizen to open their home and hearth to the performers and visitors that would come to the city. And in those days, we had very few hotels. So many of the performers, most of the performers actually stayed in private homes, as did many, as did many of the foreign visitors who came as well. So people did open every home and hearth to our visitors here. Tourists were indeed welcome. In later years, the festival faced intense competition from Manchester, England, Salzburg, Austria, and other cities throughout the world. And a report was commissioned entitled in the 19, early uh, 2000, uh, Thundering Hooves, that showed that uh, compared to other cities, the Edinburgh festivals received significantly less funding than their competing cities. And that's where the word thundering hood comes from, the competitors. A few years later, there was an economic, social, and for the first time, environmental impact study conducted by the festivals. And this showed the growing value of the festivals to our city, which is a bit north of 300 million pounds. And it also reported their negative impacts. And this led to the beginning of the invention of the word over tourism, which has been adopted by many of the heritage historic preservation groups as a rallying cry throughout our city. To give you a further example of how the um, city uh, festivals are structured, in 2011, two of my PhD students who were economists actually created this model as a festival input output model, studying three of the major festivals, the uh, International Festival, the Festival Fringe, and the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. And as you can see, whether it be investors and creditors, venues, other suppliers, <clears throat> employees, there is significant input into our festival holding organizations. That's what the term FHO means. And then in terms of output, you see flowing throughout the economy, we have the uh, trickle effect of cash, creativity, branding, uh, and for the city and for the country. And then of course, the further economic and social impacts that we receive. And this flows to government, through taxes, to, uh, through our audiences, and through sponsorships and donations. These are indeed very large 
and complex businesses. So there was a growing need then for research. And so the two economists who conducted this study with my supervision came to the following conclusion in 2011. There's a growing need for the festival holding organizations to identify new sources of funding that beyond that historically provided that were provided by the public sector or earned income such as ticket sales and a combination. And they recommended that a combination of banks, venture capital firms, and a new group called venture philanthropic organizations, VPs, provide valuable alternative funding sources in the future so that the reliance is not so strong upon ticket sales and government support in the future. Before we look at the pre-COVID period, I also want to help define a little bit further the scope of the festivals currently in Edinburgh. According to the Edinburgh uh, Festivals website, there are currently 11 major festivals. At one time, they were 12 because the Mela was considered the Mela Festival, one of the, the major festivals in our city. And as I mentioned, these festivals are big businesses. They employ hundreds of people and have several hundred million turnover uh, in terms of economic impact. For our study, uh, we looked at, as I said earlier, the three oldest festivals, or three of the oldest festivals, the Tattoo, the EIF, and the Fringe. And we found uh, by using public information to study them, that the more mature the festival is, the older the festival is, the more economically stable they appeared to be. However, all of the festivals, every one of them suffered from precarious financial stability, surviving from year to year due to the lack of reserves and also the lateness of funding announcements from the government. Many of these festivals such as the AIF require many years of future planning to be able to schedule the top uh, companies throughout the world and the funding was simply not available until recent years that far in advance. So we found this unsustainable in our study and recommended that there be further emphasis upon venture philanthropy, bank financing and other. And of course the 11 major festivals are the film festival, the science festival, the jazz and blues, the festival of art, the EIF, the Festival Fringe, the Royal Military Tattoo, the Children's Festival, the Book Festival, the Storytelling Festival, and others. And of course, this is what we think of in the pre-COVID period. And this is the wonderful view of the Royal Mile with thousands of people enjoying all of the buskers, uh, et cetera. And then, sadly, in March of 2020, this is what I found when I strolled down the Royal Mile the last week of March. Suddenly and without warning, the festivals announced that they would postpone their events until summer of 2021. They also sought financial support from Creative Scotland and from the UK government. And some support has been forthcoming, however, certainly not enough to sustain them for very much longer, unless there is an extension, further extension of the support th scheme. The festivals have also announced that they will be revisiting their visions, their missions and values to make certain that they align more closely with those of their constituents in the post pandemic world. For example, the Fringe has announced a new potential emphasis upon environmental sustainability. The Edinburgh International Festival has spoken about year-round programming to reach underserved populations. The Book Festival has moved online and very effectively, I might add, and this is all in just early days in the first year. What, however, is lacking in my view is an overall strategy that is due to the lack of long-term guidance provided by the Scottish government. And of course, this is understandable because the virus mutates, it changes, human behavior changes. So it's very difficult for the government to develop uh, long-term planning. So the question or key question becomes, 
What is going to be next for our festivals to provide greater long-term economic, social, and environmental sustainability? What might we see in the long-term future? Well, we know, according to studies by the World Tourism Organization and others, and the World Tourism Organization is a constituent organization of the United Nations, that international air travel is not predicted to come back to its pre-COVID period in terms of um, passenger lift until mid to late 2022. Because our festivals rely upon international performers and they rely upon international audience members, this could be a significant challenge um, if we do not return to our pre-COVID uh, international passenger lift soon. And this gives you an example, a comparative example of compared to previous shocks to the economic system, such as September the 11th, SARS and others, where we are with COVID. It shows that the COVID-19 crisis compares to previous disasters. However, in the case of COVID-19, the rebound has been very slow, unlike the others, and it's only been incremental in time. And so in terms of creative Scotland's examination of audience demand, you might ask, during this period where all festivals have been canceled, what is the audience thinking? Well, according to a study of about 1,200 people, a uh, cross um, uh, proportional study throughout Scotland, we found that more than half the population, 56%, say they really miss attending cultural venues and events. And I'm sure many of you who are watching and listening feel the same way. There is a wariness among the culture going public as regards to returning to venues and events as restrictions ease. So even though they want to come back, they're still wary and they're more wary about being in a theater than they are with other leisure activities such as sports events. 98% of those surveyed are engaging with cultural activity from home during the COVID-19 pandemic, but only a small proportion, 17%, say that they, they are actually willing to pay for cultural content that is moved online due to the pandemic. So this creates a conundrum and how do we fund culture in the future? How do we fund our festivals? And finally, there was much more appetite for attending outdoor events with the prospect of drive-in cinema screenings, which we've seen down South and in the United States and gigs, open air concerts and plays and park festivals holding the most appeal in the future. Now, one interesting development took place just a couple of days ago in Oklahoma City, when this band decided to create an event using these inflatable bubbles. Actually, they had 100 bubbles and each bubble would contain up to three people. So they could actually have 300 people. There was a little tube to blow air so that people could breathe and feel cool inside the bubble. They could raise their hand and a server would bring them a drink, etc. And of course the band was in a bubble as well. And by the way, the reason the band chose Oklahoma City is because the band leader was from Oklahoma City and he was known in the days of when you could have a normal gig or concert, he would climb inside one of these bubbles, bubbles and do crowd surfing. So he got the idea from that. But the maximum amount of attendees at an event like this would be 300, unlike the tens of thousands they were used to performing before in the uh, pre-COVID period. So this is just one example of the kind of creativity you're seeing to preserve, to continue to produce culture during this COVID period. And so we come to how do we make these festivals that are so beloved by ourselves and millions of people all over the world more resilient? Because even though we may find that the vaccine is effective for COVID, that we're effective with social distancing, even using bubbles at some point, there is always the 
potential of some new nightmare around the next corner? How do we make certain that we are prepared for whatever may come our way in the future? Well, Dr. Rosalind Darrett of Southern Cross University has written a very good book entitled Enduring Festivals. And it's about her theory of all great festivals must have place, residents, and vendors to be successful. And they must promote image and identity, cultural tourism, and create a sustainable sense of community and place. She also suggests that the essential components of a resilient festival city are collaboration and cooperation, creativity, adaptability, innovation, proactivity, and engagement. And then in terms of governance from our national and local level, prudent preparation and planning, leadership and advocacy, responsibility and learning. And then in terms of the nature and context of the event, an awareness of the natural environment and the built environment. And finally, infrastructure and capacity building must be resilient through constant research and continuing evaluation. And now, as I promised, I'm going to offer you three scenarios for 2022. I want to suggest to you that these scenarios are questions. They are not fait accomplis. And yes, I have a crystal ball. However, my crystal ball stopped working the end of March 2020, as probably did yours as well. So these are not answers. Rather, they are propositions or hypotheses. I believe that one of the questions we might ask is, will we have a slow tourism and overall economic recovery commencing in early 2022, as suggested by the World Tourism Organization? Will there be some short to midterm uncertainty regarding future pandemics? In other words, we saw in the Creative Scotland study, a large percentage of the population are still wary about returning to an indoor theater. Will financial weakness in the public and private markets result in reduced spending in the mid to long term for our festivals going forward? And then the question becomes, will the festivals be relegated in the future? Well, I think this is highly unlikely. They're too important culturally, economically, socially to our city, to our country, and I would argue to the world. Will we retain the status quo? Will we simply return to the previous normal or will we find the new normal? I think this might be somewhat likely in the mid to long term, but again, time will tell. And of course, the development of the virus and its ultimate cure. And then the final question is, will we be able to reinvent, to align these cultural treasures with the new post-COVID environment. I think this is highly likely because my friends, this is the city of the Scottish Enlightenment. This is the city that, and the country that through John Knox mandated reading as one of the most important skills that we can have. And so I believe that the sense of invention, the sense of science, the sense of of innovation in Edinburgh is still sufficiently strong to allow us to be able to reinvent and align these festivals to be comfortable with the new environment in the post-COVID world. And so the question becomes, will the events be smaller in size? Some suggest they may be. Will they be shorter in duration in terms of face-to-face performances and maybe longer online and in perpetuity online? And will they be sharper? Will there be greater hybridization where technology and live performance is delivered seamlessly so that when you're sitting in the festival theater, those at home would be able to view the performance just as they would a sports event at the same time and benefit from it either online or live face-to-face? -face. Will it be seamlessly integrated and will live events be delivered from bespoke festival parks in some of the 
parks or squares in our city that are underutilized to bring the festival to more underserved populations in the future and to help reduce what some refer to as over-tourism. And so that brings up the question, if that's 2022 and beyond, what about 2021? Well, Paul Valéry, the French poet, had the best answer. He said, the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. And that's why my crystal ball stopped working at the end of March in 2020. We really don't know. But what we do know is we may see this. Yes, we may see more online simultaneous transmission of our festivals and cultural events to reach wider audiences throughout the world. And that may be simultaneous with these live performances, such as this concert at the Usher Hall. And in fact, we may see this form of hybridization where we have live performances with live audience members, smaller in number and perhaps socially distanced and a wider audience at home participating in the live event. Now, before I take your questions, I want to share with you one short story. When I went back to university at age 40 to earn my doctorate, I decided that I wanted to interview experts in the field of live events. And so I asked my supervising professor, should I go to Edinburgh to speak to the festival directors? Should I go to Adelaide, Australia? Should I go to Salzburg, Austria? Where should I go? To my surprise, he sent me to a care home where the average age of the patients was in their early 90s. He said, I want you to ask these people to tell you about their experience with live events during their long lifetime. And then I want you to analyze and report on what you've heard. So I went to the care home and most of the people were quite elderly. As I got to the end of my questions, I noticed they were getting very uh, restful and uh, restless. And I noticed there was one lady sitting in the front row in a push chair with a chair uh, tray in front of her. And to my surprise, just as I got up to leave, she slammed her hand upon the tray and she said, young man, well, I told you I was 40 years old. So being called young man got my attention. I said, yes, ma'am. She said something that I will never forget. Blinking back tears, she said, what you're describing are not merely festivals. They're not merely events. Really, I said, what are they? And she whispered, these are the milestones of our lives. I said, what do you mean by milestone, madam? I was now curious. She said, I met my husband at a festival. We were married 60 years. My daughter, when it was time for her to marry, wanted her father to walk her down the aisle, but he was diagnosed with cancer six months before. We didn't think he would make it, but he did. In the push chair, he wheeled down the aisle holding his daughter's hand and he died several weeks later, but he achieved that milestone. When I moved into this care home, my friends and family came to make certain that I would be safe and to know that I was loved. So I asked her, why is this so important to you now? And later I learned she was 98 years young. She said, because when you reach our age, you forget all the other little things in life. You can't even remember the last conversation you've had or the last meal that you enjoyed. But what you do remember are these milestones. And when I finally asked, but why are they so important to you? She answered, because these are the things that make our lives worth living. And so my friends, I'm convinced that we must ensure that the Edinburgh festivals are not reduced, relegated, but rather they can be reinvented to delight 
future generations and grow from strength to strength. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. That was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Thank you. I do have a few questions here for you. Our first one is from Tom, and he's asking, um, thinking particularly of the fringe, many venues are ad hoc, temporary installations in existing buildings. Larger venues such as the Usher Hall and Assembly Rooms will be able to pivot to uh, streaming in-person events fairly easily given their physical space and resources. Is there an even greater benefit though for smaller venues in being able to effectively expand their capacity through streaming if a central fringe platform is created for them to market those events? Thank you, Tom. I've actually argued for the last 10 years, as John mentioned, the importance of creating a dual platform face-to-face -face and online. Ever since the development of the internet, we've seen in the growth of YouTube, which is now one of the most popular, if not the most popular social media channel, uh, the desire for people to be able to have cultural experiences online. One of the first groups that I proposed this to was the military tattoo, because as you know, years ago, the military tattoo began screening one performance on the BBC. And as I said to the military tattoo, even before the Metropolitan Opera started their monthly live from the Met in high definition broadcast and before the National Theater and before Glyndebourne began doing this online in cinemas, I suggested that the tattoo should be also broadcasting to cinemas because of the huge diaspora and population of Scots all over the world. For whatever reason, they did not progress my idea. But now I think they may, as a result of COVID, have other thoughts. And I think any venue, whether it be large or small, must ask the question, how can I create a hybrid approach to reach the widest possible audience in the future? And also, Tom, to always have the backup in place, because we hope this will be the last um, mutation of the virus. We hope it'll be the last virus in our lifetime, but we can't be sure it'll be the last interruption of live events. So having this online option will grow more and more important in the future. Next question, Heather. Yep, I've got one here from Susan, and um, I believe John, do you, do you have a question there? Yes. <clears throat> do you want Susan first? You go first, John, and then I'll come back okay, to thank you. I'm particularly interested in this idea of completely new, bespoke, socially distanced venues, which it strikes me could in some ways be better placed out of town or in a, a wider definition of Edinburgh's geography. And I would suggest a very good starting point would be Queen Margaret University. Thank you, Susan. And yes, I agree with you that expanding the physical footprint for our festivals is very important. And it's important because while the festivals historically have been associated with Edinburgh, over the years, they've grown to uh, attract visitors from throughout Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom. So I think having satellite venues uh, such as a hub and spoke approach where some of the hub venues are in Edinburgh, but then you have other venues in more um, physically uh, 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 achievable spaces out with the city center uh, will help also with this issue that the heritage organizations constantly raise about over tourism. It'll help move uh, the audience um, uh, to other places where there literally is physically more space. Okay, excellent. Um, and this is from Susan. Uh, she thanks you for a very interesting and topical presentation. She says, you've focused on the festivals and their organizations, but my concern is about the artists, performers, writers, and supporting companies such as Sound Services, um, who are most likely freelancers. They have received very little or no support from the UK government. Also, for the UK, what about the unintended consequences of Brexit, visas and additional costs, for example? Thank you. Thank you. I was very pleased to see today that the First Minister announced this week the additional support for wedding venues and suppliers in the wedding industry, which, like many 
different uh, parts of the supply chain of the larger events industry has been devastated. And so I am hopeful that as we slowly find an exit from this terrible pandemic, that more support is available. Because if not, we're going to lose some of the central supply chain links, such as sound, lighting, physical staging, and all of those elements that are going to be needed when events return. We're also going to lose the institutional memory. Because unless people practice their trade on a regular basis, they are not as effective once things uh, begin to reoccur. And um, what was the second part of that question, Heather? Um, it was about um, Brexit and its unintended consequences, especially considering visas and additional costs for performance. Right. Well, we all know that Scotland, of course, voted to remain in the EU. And uh, I believe that Scotland will suffer along with the rest of the EU, uh, especially from the, um, uh, the Schengen Agreement, the inability to uh, travel, uh, the need for visas. We're already seeing that. The other day I was in a meeting with a builder, a developer of one of our largest developments in the city. The structure is almost complete, but I asked, will you be able to open on time? And the answer was similar to what I gave you today, it's an unknown unknown. And the reason it's unknown is because of Brexit. The inability for people to travel here to do the work, people to travel here to, um, to uh, provide supplies, to provide expertise, to finish up the building itself. So yes, I think Brexit will have a severe repercussion uh, going forward. Um, there's a great question here from Rui Paris. Rui, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, my concern as a long-term resident of Edinburgh and as a great supporter of the arts and festivals for 40 years is that the multiple festivals have spawned short-term lets and Airbnb properties in the city. This has bumped up prices for those residents seeking to buy and contributed to the breakdown of our neighbourhoods and communities. How can we enjoy festivals and stop the destruction of our local communities? Thank you, Rui, for that question. As I mentioned, when the festivals began in 1947, John Falconer, the Lord Provost at the time, encouraged the citizenry to open every home and hearth to welcome the performers, to welcome the uh, audiences because there were not enough hotels, etc. I just wonder going forward if we might be returning to some of those days where performers do stay with families, not in B&Bs, but with families in our city. And in terms of the, uh, the issue with B&Bs and hotels, again, I wonder if we are able to create a hub and spoke approach to move the festivals to uh, regional performance sites, such as someone mentioned Queen Margaret University earlier, if that might take pressure off of the city center hotel demand or B&B &B demand. I also know that the City of Edinburgh Council has looked very seriously at the issue of Airbnbs and is seeking to provide some regulatory support for that. And I think that's very welcome by all of us. Absolutely. Um, I have here from John um, saying you'd be intrigued to learn your views as to the power and influence of assembly, gilded balloon and underbelly and whether the fringe whether the fringe society still has anything by way of control? That's a very good question, John. And of course, historically, we know that when the festival began, it was a central organization, really two organizations, the International Festival and the Fringe as a coordinating body. And um, then over time, it grew to a much more commercial enterprise with the majority of performances now, for example, being from comedy um, uh, centered uh, type venues. So the short answer is, it's a supply and demand question. If the demand from audiences is for more of the comedian uh, type of uh, cultural um, aspect of the festival, or if it is more uh, in the future for theater or dance or drama, et cetera, that's going to drive the overall
commercial nature of who the producers are, et cetera. So it will be interesting to see going forward if the festival does retain this commercial growth trajectory in terms of the influence of the commercial producers or if the increase in the number of smaller venues, which are not commercially viable for many producers, may reduce the influence of these uh, large commercial producers. So time will tell. And we're looking forward to it. <laughs> um, Gordon is asking, um, well, he's saying firstly, thank you for an inspiring talk, which we can all agree. Um, in recent years, I've noted an increase in anti-festival opinion. How do we counter this? It's interesting that in the 15 years that I have lived in Edinburgh, I've seen the arc really incrementally go from pushback to, you know, too many visitors in August, um, too much uh, negative impact, etc., to a very sharp trajectory the last two years with the adoption of this term over tourism. And I think the answer, Gordon, is very simple. It's information and education. Our festival holding organizations need to mount a year round effort to inform and educate citizens. And I mean, starting with schools and primary level as to the value of culture, the value of uh, community, of people coming together around a common purpose, a common interest, so that we return to that civic pride that we had in 1947 with the first festival. And the only way to do that is through a sustained information education campaign. You can't do it just when people complain or when the loudest voices are heard. You can't shout them down. You have to continually show the value of culture and the value of community, which is what culture does. It brings us together uh, as, a, as a unified body. Um, unlike other types of public events, when I think of sport, you think of competition of two sides competing with one another. You don't have competition in a play in the audience or in a concert. You have communal bonding and uh, we need to promote that in civil society. Um, Joe, are you happy for maybe one or two more questions? Is that all right? Thank yes, you. indeed. Um, we've got a question here from Jim. Uh, he asks, how do you see broadcast by mass media coming in alongside live audience and online audience at home? Perhaps a range of ways of enjoying entertainment operating simultaneously. Well, I see it as something that we're already embracing as a result of the COVID period. For example, I am a uh, member of the trustees of the Edinburgh Interfaith Association. And anecdotally, we're finding in churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places of worship, attendance has significantly increased online because especially folk who are older, may be physically challenged, uh, uh, not ambulatory, they're able now to log on on a Friday night or a Sunday morning and actually participate, whereas before it would have required a travel to experience. So I see this growing exponentially and also with devices such as our mobile phones where we can take culture with us 24 seven and experience it in a very high quality way. I can only see that if the cultural organizations that comprise our festivals do not jump on this train before it leaves the station, they're going to be left behind. We've got a question here from Paul, which is quite a practical one. Um, Paul is saying he has an idea for an outdoor event in Edinburgh, but having no access to funding, who can they approach to ask for help and for funding help. Thank you, Paul. Our study in 2011 suggested that non-traditional organizations such as venture philanthropists, VPs, a venture philanthropist is someone similar to a venture capitalist who gives money to a cultural event or a social enterprise organization. 
And rather than a cash reward, in other words, a return in cash on their investment, they want their reward to be demonstrating that they're doing good for society, that you are feeding more children, putting more bums in seats for folk to enjoy culture, et cetera, year after year. So looking at non-traditional sources of funding, such as wealthy individuals and organizations as venture philanthropists, as well as we also found there was some appetite among banks to provide bank financing for these larger events. Thank you. Um, and will we call this one the last question? Okay. If you don't, um, this from Morag, how can we turn Brexit into an opportunity to develop all the much needed skills, for example, lighting specialists that have previously come from abroad? Morag, that's a wonderful question. I hope that one of the positive outcomes of Brexit will be a greater emphasis by the Scottish government and Scottish education in training the workforce of tomorrow. So that just as we developed great skills among our trades in the 19th century and early 20th century in Edinburgh, we develop new skills in sound design, in film, in television, in theater, in lighting, etc that we create a new renaissance in our city or in, or in our country, a new Scottish enlightenment in terms of culture. However, that said, we should also draw upon the best experts anywhere in the world to share their expertise with us because societies, just like human beings, only grow through diversity. We need a diverse workforce. So I hope one day Scotland will be able once again to welcome the world to our festival city and our festival country. That's fantastic and uh, a great place to end. Um, we'll just pop over to, to John who I think has some closing, closing words and thanks for you, Joe. Thank you, Heather, and thank you so much, Joe, for a truly fascinating hour, during which, by tracing the origins of the Edinburgh Festivals, you have shown us that there could yet be some knowns lurking amongst all those unknowns. Our politicians and scientists have necessarily been a bit short on hope. You can check that out by going to a live Downing Street conference right now, I think. But you, I feel, have introduced on this dark January evening some possibilities that the Edinburgh Festivals may yet be reinvented for the good of our culture and community. So thank you so much, Joe. I'd like to read a loud round of applause. We can't do that, but you know we're doing that in spirit. Thank you. You get that reaction. Thank you, and I'll just uh, remind everyone here today that you can join the Saltar Society at saltarsociety.org.uk um, and become a member and help support um, these kind of events. And that also, now very excitingly, the Edinburgh um, branch launched uh, all of their tickets for the next few months of events. Uh, you've got a, a, month, a wonderful programme put together by the committee. Um, so please go back on to Eventbrite and um, yeah, get book your tickets now to see all those brilliant events as well. Thank you. And thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Heather and John, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.